let's start the next talk. Um, Neta uh, will tell us about model of black holes evaporation. Okay, 35 minutes plus five, uh, 10 minutes for questions, please. I, uh, thank you very much. Um, it's very nice to see uh, everyone's faces. It, it, very nice that some people are keeping their videos turned on. It makes it feel like I'm speaking to a machine, so thank you for doing that. Um, so I, uh, I realize there's a bit of a miscoordination between this talk and the last one. There will be a significant amount of overlap uh, in the first half of this talk, but uh, not too much in the second half, so there will be something new. The only caveat is that if you watched my talk last week at the New England Strings meeting, then there will be literally nothing new. So if that's, uh, if that's the case for you, then you should feel free to, uh, to tune in in the questions if you have any questions. But um, there won't be anything new in this talk that wasn't in the talk on Friday if you watched that one. Uh, okay, so this is a talk about models of black hole evaporation, specifically in ADS. And I don't think that to this crowd, I really need to uh, spend much time motivating um, why we're interested in the information paradox. I think that we're all interested in quantum gravity. And uh, of course, whenever we have a paradox, then that means we're thinking about things not 100% correctly. And that's a good place to start. So, um, so the outline of this talk, I'm going to spend a, a little bit of time introducing the problem and the general approach. And then I'll talk about two different models of black hole evaporation in ADS. So the first one is a semi-classical model of ADS black hole evaporation. And this is based on the paper with uh, Ahmed, Don, and Henry from May. And this is the part that's going to have some uh, significant overlap with Juan's talk. Now, um, this talk, th this paper has also been discussed in a number of conferences since May. So I will try to spend not too much time on the technical details and just on the overall takeaways. And then I'll spend the rest of the talk discussing what I'm going to call a somewhat classical model of uh, ADS black hole evaporation, which is based on a paper from uh, this fall with Chris Akers and Daniel Harlow. And I say somewhat classical in the sense that it's classical because we don't have any quantum fields propagating, but it's only somewhat classical because we've exchanged that uh, by conservation of misery for uh, dynamical topology change. So we've given up quantum fields, but instead we've, uh, that came at the price of changing the topology. And then I'll wrap up with some summary. So let me begin with some introduction. Now, as I said earlier, most of us will uh, agree the information paradox is interesting. And in addition, I think most of us will probably also agree that quantum gravity is a unitary theory. But actually resolving the information paradox it amounts to more than just a bunch of physicists getting in a room and deciding by popular mandate that the quantum gravity had better be unitary. The resolving the information paradox really requires us to have a very detailed understanding of the dynamics um, of the state and in particular the way in which information gets out. So here I've drawn a, an asymptotically flat black hole and everyone can see my cursor, right? That's, you can see my cursor when I'm moving it on the screen. Please nod or something. Yes. Yes, okay, great. Uh, so uh, here I've drawn an asymptotically flat black hole and we have, this is a black hole that's formed from collapse. We have the event horizon here and there's just a, here's a pair of entangled particles across it. So this sigma prime here is a time slice of this space time after the evaporation uh, has been completed. And sigma here is a time slice before the evaporation. And of course, the problem is that we can form a black hole from a pure state. And Hawking's calculation from the 1975 tells us that at not sigma prime, it would appear prima facie at least that the state has become mixed. So we've evolved from a pure state to a mixed state and, uh, and lost unitarity somehow. And this, for this reason, the von Neumann entropy of the radiation, so minus trace rho log rho, rho rad here, is the density matrix of the radiation has traditionally served as a very good diagnostic for information loss or information conservation via this curve that we call the page curve after page who first proposed it. So before I talk about the page curve, let me just talk about the uh, behavior of two different entropies of the system. So here we have the evaporating black hole system yeah, I'm plotting entropy against time. So we have two potential entropies of interest. So there's the entropy of the radiation as computed by Hawking. This starts out in a pure state uh, with zero entropy before we radiated anything essentially. And eventually, and this, this increases as the black hole radiates. 
and eventually it becomes it saturates at a constant value after the evaporation. We also have the entropy of the black hole, the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy, which we compute using the area over 4GH bar formula. Essentially, this is uh, computing the, the uh, dimension of the Hilbert space. And this entropy starts out at some value when the black hole has some size, and then it decreases as a function of time. The reason it decreases is because we're violating the null energy condition with Hawking radiation. So Hawking's uh, area theorem tells us that entropy increases as a function of time, but this is only, so the area of the black hole increases as a function of time, but this is only true as long as the Hawking area theorem is valid, which is to say the null energy condition is satisfied. So by validating the null energy condition with quantum fields, with this uh, Hawking state of the quantum fields, we allow ourselves to uh, have a decreasing area of the black hole, and indeed this is what happens until the black hole size goes down to zero. So these are the two different entropies of interest in the process of the black hole evaporation. And what, uh, what paid the page curve is this unitary curve over here. So this is tracking the behavior of, say, the entropy of the radiation, which again starts out at zero and increases, but at some point, after the black hole evaporated um, half its mass, then we have a situation where the late entropy had better be purified by the, by, by the earlier radiation. So the late, the late radi radiation has to be purified by what we already have in the system, because if our entropy, if our evolution is overall unitary, then uh, the two, this is two subsets had better purify one another. And so what happens is eventually the, the entropy has to start decreasing and eventually go down to zero. So this curve, which we call the page curve or the unitary curve, is, um, is a litmus test or a smoking gun signal for unitary evolution of the system. Now, I should say a disclaimer, which is that a computation of the page curve on its own does not amount to a resolution of the information paradox. It is a very useful tool, but nonetheless, entropy is a coarse-grained quantity. And it doesn't actually tell us exactly what the state is doing. So a resolution, a complete resolution of the black hole information paradox would require a fine-grained understanding of the state of the radiation and the dynamics of the system. In order to actually look at the Hawking radiation and say, is this pure or mixed? How is it, what, how, what caused it to evolve in a particular way? We need to know more than just the page curve. Nonetheless, a direct calculation of the page curve is a very large step forward. And until recently, it was not considered feasible by the broad community. So we, didn't, we may not have really bothered to put a distinction between resolving the information paradox and computing the page curve, simply because there was an expectation that a calculation of the page curve would require extensive knowledge of non-perturbative quantum gravity physics, which may in fact be tantamount to having a fine-grained understanding of the state. So it turns out that, of course, what I'm going to talk about now, that this is not the case. And the reason is that um, we actually do have some knowledge of non-perturbative physics. So we might say we need an extensive knowledge of non-perturbative physics to compute the page curve. That might be something that we would suspect. And we may have suspected we don't have the tools in our arsenal to do this. But as it turns out, we do know a little bit about non-perturbative quantum gravity. And this meeting is in fact dedicated to a, an aspect that we are that we know of, which is holography. So we can think of holography as a non-perturbative formulation of quantum gravity. And in relation to the last talk, there's a sense in which the Euclidean uh, path integral, the, the gravitational uh, Euclidean gravitational path integral, also knows something about uh, non-perturbative quantum gravity, although it's not clear why or, or how. So we do have the, a couple of tools that can help us get insight into non-perturbative physics and might allow us to calculate the page curve, which again is not a panacea for solving everything we need to know about information paradox, but does take us a long way forward. So the new developments starting in May and still unfolding as of now, have really changed our, uh, our, this idea that we need to know so much more than we currently do uh, in order to calculate the page curve. You can calculate the page curve for unitary black hole evolution with no direct input from non-perturbative quantum gravity physics. You can use purely semi-classical physics, which is what we did. You just, at every step of the calculation, you're only using semi-classical physics in order to compute the page curve. And that sounds funny because Hawking used semi-classical physics to calculate information loss. And here we are using semi-classical physics to calculate information conservation. 
And the answer is that I qualified this statement with, by saying there's no direct input from non-perturbative quantum gravity. And I say this because the calculation itself is semi-classical, but it is heavily motivated by holography. And this interpretation of the calculation, and the interpretation of the quantity that we calculate as an entropy is provided to us by holography. So today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss both the original setup from May. So this was a uh, joint work with Ahmed, Don, and Henry, and also in parallel by Jeff. And in this work, we have us do a semi-classical analysis of an evaporating ADS black hole that produces a unitary pH curve. And then I'll also discuss a newer model of an eva evaporation process that exchanges the semi-classical analysis for purely classical analysis, as I said earlier, at the exchange of at the cost of dynamical topology change. And this is work with Chris and Daniel. And I should say both models feature quantum extremal islands. So this, this paper by Ahmed, Raghu, uh, Juan, and Ying was also another one, another classical, purely classical model. It's going to be rather different from the one that, I'm, that I'll discuss in the second half of this talk. But they, all of these models share this, uh, this feature of the quantum extremal island that was discussed earlier in the last talk. So I'm going to now move on to a semi-classical model of ADS black hole evaporation. And again, because this has been discussed uh, as a, almost ad infinitum in previous conferences, I'm going to be a little bit light on the technical details on this. And I'll talk more about the details of the second model later. So the qualitative setup is that we want to evaporate an ADS black hole. Now, there's a bit of a problem here, which is that we don't really know, at least we did not really know, how to evaporate ADS black holes. So a small, small ADS black holes do evaporate, but we don't really understand small ADS black holes. And conservation of misery tells us that uh, something is gonna happen to prevent us from doing it for large ADS black holes, which indeed is the case. Large ADS black holes simply do not evaporate. So the trick here is that we are going to evaporate a large ADS black hole, and we're going to do that, we're going to force it to evaporate by coupling it to an external bath. So in this work, we worked with a two-sided black hole. So here we have uh, the two-sided black hole. There's a right side, right CFT, and left CFT. And in this setup, prior to evaporation, they have the bifurcation surface for the left side and the bifurcation surface for the right side coincide. So this is the geometry prior to evaporation. And we're going to evaporate the right side into an external reservoir. So the general idea, here we have the bulk on one side and this reservoir on the other side. The reservoir is in its ground state. So at some point uh, before that we couple the two, these two, the bulk has reflecting boundary conditions off of the asymptotic boundary. And then at some point we couple these two and then there's free exchange between the bath and the bulk, which causes the black hole to evaporate. Now you can either work with this in the sense of uh, putting the setup and, try, and then deriving various qualitative statements, or you can try to do the calculation directly. And doing the calculation directly and explicitly is, uh, is much more tractable if you work in ADS2 than in higher dimensions. So uh, higher dimensions, you can work with spherical symmetry and do some similar statements, which was, that was uh, done by Jeff. We're going to work in a very explicit setting where we can do the calculation in a very uh, clear way, which allows, which is really best done in, uh, in ADS2 in JT gravity. So just a lightning review here of uh, JT coupled to conformal matter. So we're going to work with this, uh, with this model over here. So here I've written down the action of JT coupled to a CFT. I wanna be explicitly clear here. The, the CFT is not the CFT that lives on the boundary. This is not zero plus one dimensional. This is a one plus one dimensional CFT that lives in the bulk. And the action is we have this topological term, which I didn't bother writing out. Then we have the gravitational dynamics over here. This here is the biloton. And then we have the CFT action right here. Now this is in some sense a very boring uh, theory, at least geometrically. The metric is always ADS2. So uh, here I've picked one set of coordinates, one correct coordinates for ADS2. You can pick any other set of coordinates you want. And in fact, those of you who read uh, the paper with uh, Don Henry and Ahmed, we will see that we've used a very large set of coordinates in order to do the calculation. Now the dynamics of this theory are not given by the metric, they're given by the boundary particle, which uh, the boundary time u, which you can write as a function of the Poincaré time t. Now we're going to take the bulk CFT to be in the Poincaré vacuum. And to evaporate the black hole, we do this following procedure. 
So here is the bulk. We, this is our uh, boundary time u, the physical time u. And we consider our reservoir to be an auxiliary uh, BCFT, which is in flat space. So this half of Minkowski space over here, where the time coordinate is u. And this is here is in, the, in its ground state. We couple these two at some physical time u. This is a quantum quench, which is going to result in a shock wave propagating into the bulk. And then we just evolve these forwards in time. So we are, now we have a setup where our black hole is going to evaporate and we can start computing entanglement entropies. If we were to do the naive thing, we would just calculate the entanglement entropy, the von Neumann entropy of the bath. And we, if we did that, which in fact we did do, then we're going to get the Hawking answer because that's just Hawking's calculation. We do a purely semi-classical analysis, we calculate the entropy and we find information loss. Of course, that's not what we want to do here. We want to put in some, some information about non-perturbative quantum gravity. And so we really want to use ADS-CFT to do this. So we want to calculate the von Neumann entropy using holography. And so here is a brief review of how we do that. But the first order in GH bar, we have the HRT slash FLM proposal. So, it's, it's, so let me actually begin with working to zeroth order in G, GH bar. In that case, if we wanted to compute the Neumann entropy of some reduced density matrix, so if we're working in higher dimensions, we take some boundary subregion R, we look at the reduced density matrix of so that subregion, and we can calculate its Neumann entropy using the area of an extremal surface in the bulk. So XR here is the minimal area surface that extremizes the area functional and is homologous to the region R. Now, if we want to go to one order higher in GH bar, so first order, we also need to add the von Neumann entropy of bulk quantum fields across the surface. And if we work in one plus one dimensions, then of course we, there's no area to speak of. We can't extremize the area. So instead we actually extremize the dilaton. Now, as long as the boundary system is evolving unitarily, there is no time dependence and this is just the formula. So one more quick statement about subregion subregion duality, which we'll show up later is that this, uh, the region here, so this, the, our extremal surface is what bounds this diamond over here. And the entanglement wedge, this uh, region which is space-like to this surface and to R, is uh, what's dual by a subregion subregion duality to, the, uh, to the, this region over here, D of R in the boundary. Now, in order to generalize to all orders, well, you might ask, why, is it, why, don't, why does this formula only hold to first order in GH bar and not to higher orders? And historically, we can uh, view this, we can give us a historical justification. So the consistency of the classical prescription, together with subregion subregion duality, requires various conditions for the extremal surface. For example, you have entanglement wedge nesting which is a statement that as you increase the size of the boundary region R, you expect the entanglement wedges to also increase in size. You also expect something called causal wedge inclusion, which you expect the causal wedge to lie inside the entanglement wedge so that you can't modify the entanglement entropy by um, throwing in local unitaries. And you also expect strong subjectivity. All of this can be proven as long as you assume the null curvature condition, which is the statement that RAB KA KB is greater than or equal to zero, where K here is any null vector in the space time. So in particular, if we assume the bulk equations of motion, then that means that we're expecting the expectation value of TKK to always be greater than or equal to zero. But that's not the case. Now perfectly ordinary quantum field theory states that don't satisfy this. And that would mean that in that such situations, entanglement wedge nesting, causal wedge inclusion, strong subjectivity, all of these can be violated by the HRT prescription once we include quantum back reaction. So the prescription needs some modification. And the, the reason that we, that Aaron and I proposed a particular type of modification was motivated by what happens in black hole thermodynamics. So in black hole thermodynamics, we have a similar problem. The hawking gary's theorem relies on the null energy condition and it's violated by quantum back reaction. So Bekenstein's solution, or his proposed solution, was to replace the area by something called the generalized entropy, which you can think of as a quantum corrected area. So this here is, we have the generalized entropy of a surface sigma is given by the area of that surface sigma over 4GH bar, plus a von Neumann entropy contribution. And there's a large body of evidence that indicates that the generalized entropy is UV finite. So here we have a picture 
So the surface chi sub r to denote that it's homologous to the region r. And this here is the region out. So we compute the area of this plus the entropy in this region here. So this is the prescription to all orders, which again, you saw already in the last talk, is the statement that the Vonnemann entropy of a, of a density matrix rho sub r, state of this region, is given by the generalized entropy of a quantum extremal surface, so a surface that extremizes the generalized entropy. So in a higher dimensional system, if we're in more than one plus one dimensions, this is what it looks like. And of course, in lower dimensions, we go in one plus one dimensions, we're going to replace the area here by the diliton. And using the generalized second law, you can prove various consistency relations of this. Now, an important aside, which will turn out to be uh, crucial later on, is that there's a significant difference between classical extremal surfaces and quantum extremal surfaces, in that there is, for quantum extremal surfaces, we get non-complementary recovery. What this means is that the quantum extremal surface of the region R does not have to be quantum extremal for the region R bar. So if you have a mixed bulk state, then it's possible that the quantum extremal surface for R, chi R here, does not coincide with the quantum extremal surface for R bar. So there's a gap between these two. And this is because the Vonnemann entropy of, um, of R is not equal to the Vonnemann entropy of R bar. So the quantum extremal surface of this is not equal to the quantum extremal surface of that, unless we have a pure state in the bulk. Okay, so now we have reviewed the quantum extremal surface prescription and how we calculate entanglement entropy in, uh, in ADS-CFT. So let's now take a look at quantum extremal surfaces in the evaporating black hole. So before we evaporate the black hole, we have the left and right uh, boundaries. We have the left and right quantum extremal surfaces. This is a pure state. Left and right quantum extremal surfaces coincide. Now, as we evaporate the black hole, initially, this right quantum extremal surface moves continuously in a space-like direction. And this, is, this begins, so this here is, uh, is this piece over here. But after the page time, a branch of quantum extremal surfaces that have no classical counterpart begins to dominate. So this here is a picture of what happens in the bulk. So we have this, uh, this shock wave coming in. This is due to coupling the system to the path. And you here you have a new quantum extremal surface that nucleates but doesn't dominate until a certain time later over here. And so this picture over here shows what happens when the, uh, quantum, the new quantum extremal surface dominates. So the left quantum extremal surface is unchanged because we haven't done anything to the left boundary. The right quantum extremal surface is somewhere over here. So that's right here. And there is a large region, a large gap in between the two. The effect of this jump from the quantum extremal surface of, from here to there is essentially what gives us the unitary page curve in the bulk. It also gives us this gap, which is of course a result of non-complementary recovery. Now the hypothesis, the very interesting hypothesis that uh, was in a number of papers, and um, I guess this is an anachronism, this meant to be sort of discussed in Juan's talks, anachronism from Friday. Um, so this is this region in between these two is, uh, is interesting if you consider what's going on in this system. So this here, this region over here, this entanglement wedge is dual to the left CFT. And this entanglement wedge is dual to the right CFT, which leaves us with the region over here. And if you take entanglement wedge reconstruction quite seriously, then you would hypothesize, which indeed is what was done, that the gap in between these two is precisely the entanglement wedge of the radiation. And this indeed was what was, uh, what was hypothesized in these papers. And the existence of this gap is, appears to be synonymous with the failure of complementary recovery due to extremization over a mixed state. So essentially by doing a, semi, a series of semi-classical operations that have absolutely no non-perturbative physics in them, we haven't done anything non-perturbative beyond interpreting the generalized entropy of a quantum extremal surface as computing an entropy. This has allowed us to calculate a unitary page curve which I, I honestly find pretty remarkable. I think if you'd asked me, uh, maybe not quite this time last year, but maybe a year and a half ago or two years ago, if, uh, if we could calculate the page curve using purely semi-classical operations and some input from holography, I think I would have said no. So this is, uh, this is pretty remarkable. Of course, we still don't have a complete understanding of what's going on. Now, we, we worked with a low energy effective theory and in principle, this can be, the, what we've worked with in JT gravity can be the low energy effective theory of 
a unitary and also a non-unitary UV completion. This can, we can think of the, the system that we have at hand as computing both, um, as, as, as just being the low energy truncation of, of two different theories, one is unitary and one is another. Now the quantum extremal surface prescription would only correctly compute the entropy in the unitary theory, not in a non-unitary UV completion. But if the quantum extremal surface just prescription just spits out a unitary answer, no matter whether the UV completion is unitary or not, then it's actually not telling us very much. It's sort of just an automaton that no matter what you feed it, it just gives you unitarity. Then that's, we're not, it's not teaching us very much about quantum gravity. So what we would like to know is if we had a holographic non-unitary theory, which may, such a thing may, may or may not exist, but if it existed, then would quantum extremal surfaces give us a non-unitary answer? And I think the answer is they had better because if they don't, then this prescription is, is in some sense useless and doesn't actually tell us very much about quantum gravity. It's hard to see in this model uh, how we would calculate what the holographic non-unitary theory would look like, what the quantum extremal surfaces of such a theory would do. So a simpler model would be very nice for this type of investigation. Now, what could be simpler than a semi-classical picture? Uh, the answer is, well, a classical picture would certainly be simpler than a semi-classical picture. So an example of a classical picture would be this 3D holog holography within holography picture, which is an interpretation of the calculation above. Uh, but that picture still doesn't make it clear how it would model, how, how would the quantum extremal surfaces of a non-unitary holographic theory would look like. So we're going to look at a different model that makes that very precise. And it also is going to highlight certain features of the quantum extremal island, which, uh, which, will, be, which will clarify some things. So I'm now ready to move on to the part of the talk that wasn't discussed in the last talk, which is a somewhat classical model of ADS black hole evaporation. So let's, uh, we're going to work with the toy model, a toy model of black hole evaporation that has no bulk entanglement whatsoever. And the way we do this is we're going to evaporate the black hole via the emission of smaller black holes. So we're going to think of these smaller black holes as our stand-ins for Hawking quanta. And the, the way that we're going to do this is we're going to basically use ER equals EPR to motivate that the emission of the small black hole is going to have a, uh, an ER bridge. So I'm going to draw a picture in the next slide. But this is going to result in a wormhole with a new exit. And I want to just say here that we can actually, we know how to construct just geometries in three dimensions. So we just, we can cut a Riemann surface in certain ways and it's, that gives us a time symmetric geometries that are essentially different quotients of ADS3 and our multi-boundary wormholes. So here is the picture, the dynamics that, the, the, that we're going to impose and I'm going to you now spend some time parsing it. So we start out with some black hole and we model the evaporation of this black hole as the emission of these additional black holes and these are all connected by wormholes to the original black hole over here. So this, we think of these as the Hawking radiation and we're going to model the Hawking radiation in terms of holographic CFTs just to make the picture nice and simple. Although in general, we would expect that ER equals DPR would tell us that there are such wormholes anyways. But um, just to, everything, to have everything be very simple and very precise and explicit, we're going to just say the Hawking radiation here, these are holographic CFTs and these are all connected by wormholes to the original black hole. So, each one of these is a time step. So the, every, at every time step, we're going to have the emission of an additional, uh, additional small black hole, which is our stand-in for the emission of Hawking quanta. And so we have these discrete time steps, and there's a dynamical topology change between each time step here. So we start out with, say, uh, three exits. So that means three Hawking quanta have evaporated. And we get four at the next step and five at the step after that. At every moment in time, this is a time symmetric geometry, and it has two candidate extremal surfaces for the entanglement, for the, for the Hawking radiation. So there is gamma prime, which is the, uh, and the extremal surface, which is the bifurcation surface of the original black hole. And then there's gamma, which is the union of the extremal surfaces that are the bifurcation surfaces of the radiation horizons. So we have these two competing extremal surfaces and the, we, uh, we ask, well, which one gives us the actual entanglement wedge of the Hawking radiation? And the answer is, well, that's the, for this early times, there are very few exits 
And so the sum of these is very small compared to the area of gamma prime. So at early times, I think this, sorry, no, um, yeah, sorry, there we go. So at early times, the minimal surface of these, of the Hawking radiation is just this, and the entanglement wedge of the Hawking radiation is very small, whereas the entanglement wedge of the black hole is very large. These are classical extremal surfaces, so here we do have complementary recovery. And so the extremal surface that's of the black hole, it's also gamma, and this is the entanglement wedge. Of course, as we evolve this forwards in time, eventually we're going to have so many exits that the, the, these are going to be larger area than this one. Since we're also conserving energy here, keep in mind that the area of the black hole is shrinking. So eventually gamma prime is going to have smaller area than gamma, and we're going to have a phase transition where now the dominating extremal surface is gamma prime. So now the entanglement wedge of the black hole is very small, and the entanglement wedge of the radiation is quite large. So the entanglement wedge of the radiation after there's the switchover becomes this entire, almost the entirety of the bulk. And this, this feature gives us precisely um, a page curve. So here's what we have. So this is, this is calculated again for a 3D black hole. We can do all the calculations explicitly. So we have an increasing entropy. So that corresponds to this, uh, this phase over here where we are evaporating more and more exits and we are increasing, the, so the area is increasing since the area of gamma is fixed. The area of each one of these exits is fixed. But eventually there's a turnover, there's a switchover in between the dominating extremal surfaces and then the entropy begins to decrease because as we evaporate more and more of these, the area of gamma prime decreases since we're conserving energy. So what is the island in this? Well, the island is just the region between gamma prime and gamma. So this is, this the, you can think of it in exactly the same way. The entanglement wedge of the black hole all of a sudden shrinks after the transition. And what, what is left is now encoded in the Hawking radiation. Now, a very nice aspect of this model that makes things very, very precise. As, as much as this dynamics may seem ad hoc, it makes certain things very clear. So the island phenomenon doesn't seem so strange from this perspective. It's just standard quantum error correction. And so the way we can see this is by considering different uh, subsystems of this, uh, of this uh, black hole. So if we are considering too few of the CFTs, so let's imagine that we're after the situa situation here where the C if you take all of these Hawking radiation uh, exits, and then the, um, the extremal surface is gamma prime. But let's suppose we only take just a couple of them. We take too few of the CFTs, then these no longer contain the island in them. They, they say the entanglement wedge of these two is just going to be very, very small. If we take a larger subset of the CFTs, or say we take a couple of CFTs, but with the union with the black hole, then all of a sudden we are able to get the island. This is exactly like the case where we have the three intervals on, um, on in ADS, the three intervals that comprise ADS. You take one of them and you don't get the point in the middle. You take two of them and you get the point in the middle. So it's, it's completely analogous. And it tells us that at least in this model, and probably more generally, the island is just, uh, in code, it's just literally quantum error correction. Now, this, 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 this is a model of information conservation. But I said before, we would like to understand if the quantum extremal surface prescription just always gives us a unitary answer, always gives us a page curve, or if it actually is able to give us information loss in the case where the theory actually does predict information loss. Now, I want to preface the, uh, the next slide by saying I don't subscribe to information loss, and I don't think that uh, many of us do. But it's important to try to study what happens in the case of information loss as a counterpoint to, um, to the case that we have information conservation. So we know if the um, quantum extremal surface prescription, for example, is, is a valid one or not just an automaton that always spits out the same answer. So I don't subscribe to information loss, but I find it useful to study it regardless. So what would a holographic calculation of information loss, the Hawking calculation, uh, what would it look like? So here is uh, a, so here we have a black hole. 
And so this, this thing, the idea here is that it again radiates, it radiates by um, spitting out small black holes. But these are no longer connected to the main black hole by a, um, by a wormholes. These are now connected to something that is a baby universe. It's not really a baby universe in the sense that it has a boundary, but this is a stand-in for the baby universe. So the Hawking radiation is now uh, now has this ER bridge to a different CFT altogether, a different boundary. And as we evolve forwards in time, the we get more and more of these nucleating. So every time we spit out a, a small black hole, which is the standard for the Hawking radiation, it's entangled with another universe. It's not it does not have this geometric connection to the black hole, to the original black hole. And so here, once again, we can use just classical extremal surfaces. There's no need to do anything fancy with quantum extremal surfaces and calculate uh, entanglement entropy of both quantum fields, which is very difficult and makes the semi-classical calculation very involved. We can just calculate the um, information about what's going on with the, with the entropy purely in terms of classical extremal surfaces. And indeed, in this model, we find that we get information loss if we use the standard um, extremal surface calculation. So let's see how this works. So we have two different uh, candidates for extremal surfaces. We have this gamma prime, which is the bifurcate horizon of the black hole. And then we have gamma, which is the bifurcation surface of the Hawking radiation to the so-called baby universe. Now, the gamma prime is not in fact homologous to the Hawking radiation. So it's completely irrelevant for this calculation. The only surface which has any relevance at all is this surface gamma here. So if you want to calculate the entropy of the Hawking radiation, that's given by the area of gamma. And as we emit more and more black holes, we get more and more of the gammas. And there's nothing, there's no turnover where this starts to decrease. It, it keeps on increasing until we can't evaporate any more black holes, which is to say this large black hole has completely disappeared. And so this surface gamma, we just get more and more of them and the entropy just keeps on increasing, which tells us that indeed the uh, holographic entanglement entropy proposal is quite capable of computing information loss if that is in fact what happens in your theory. Of course, we don't actually think that information really is lost in a realistic quantum theory of gravity, but this uh, this is a very it, it's this is a very helpful calculation to see, of course, that the quantum extremal surface prescription is contentful. Now, this also raises the an interesting question, which is how would we describe the Hawking answer of black hole evaporation in the semi-classical model by our quantum extremal surfaces? So let me elaborate a little bit on that. So here it's clear how we're going to model, how we model information loss. And it's clear this is essentially what the Hawking calculation was. Hawking calculated this, you would say that if he did a holographic calculation, this is the model that he used. And we would like to understand what would be the model that he used in the JT gravity coupled to conformal matter um, model. What would be the, what, what did he calculate holographically? Um, this is, the, I should, should say this is current work in progress with Chris and Daniel to understand what is the, what is the state whose entropy Hawking actually calculated in this evaporating black hole picture, which, uh, which we studied in JT gravity. Now I want to do a final comparison here of this uh, very simple and instructive model of dynamical topology change of unitary versus non-unitary evolution. So here we have the top picture again, where the smiley face stands for information conservation. Just to remind you all, this is what I'm advocating and not the bottom picture. Um, so here we have this information conservation picture where the Hawking radiation is linked by wormhole to the original black hole. And again, this is motivated by this classical picture of the quantum octopus of ER equals EPR. And here we have the um, information loss picture. Now we might have said in the top picture that the wrong the Hawking calculation, the wrong calculation that gives you information loss, corresponds to essentially using the wrong extremal surface. That instead of doing a switch over to gamma prime when it becomes minimal, that we're just always using gamma to calculate the entropy of the radiation, even past the point where gamma is non-dominant. So even past the point where gamma has larger area than gamma prime. Now in the bottom picture, we would have said the wrong calculation would be to switch between gamma and gamma prime when the when gamma prime has smaller area than gamma. But of course, that's the wrong calculation in this picture 
because gamma prime is just not homologous to the Hawking radiation. So it's completely irrelevant to the problem at hand. The takeaway though, is that using the wrong saddle here gives the wrong answer, but the wrong answer for the right theory can be information conservation. So you might use the wrong, the, the wrong saddle and get information conservation, get unitarity. It all essentially depends on what is your quantum gravity theory? What is the, the, the dynamics the, of your UV complete theory? All right, so let me, let me summarize. I actually have no idea how I'm doing on time, so I'm, but I'm just going, I'll wrap up in a few minutes in case I'm starting to go over. So uh, begin with, again, uh, let me finish up with, again, some uh, motivation. So understanding the information paradox is really of paramount importance. For understanding space-time, space-time emergence in quantum gravity, better understanding of quantum gravity. And holography provides a tractable way of modeling black hole evaporation with semi-classical tools which I think is something that uh, we had no idea would be the case uh, not so long ago. Now the question of quantum gravity dynamics and defines the grain structure of the state is important. It's not one that we have yet to address to, to anyone's satisfaction, I would say. The, we, we haven't talked about quantum gravity dynamics, we haven't talked about the fine grain structure of the state, and that is critical for understanding uh, the information paradox. So as, as we saw in this picture that compared the answers between unitary and non-unitary theories, the dynamics of the evaporation process, whether the black holes formed a, uh, a classical octopus or whether they instead gave you this disconnected, two disconnected geometries, that's critical for whether we have information loss or conservation. And we haven't really addressed what are the dynamics and how information gets out or if I'm an observer who's sitting in the asymptotic region and I have some, uh, I'm a very capable observer, but very capable experimentalist and I'm really measuring the radiation. Um, do I see a mixed state? Do I see a pure state? Uh, what, how, what is the evolution via which the state came from the black hole? Now, we also have not understood the role of the Hawking calculation in all of this. So this is a complaint that I've been airing out in a couple of different talks. Uh, when I asked this question from various people in the past few months, I've been told uh, Hawking forgot to include a saddle. He, the thing is that I, I, I started losing my mind after I heard this maybe for the fourth time and I went and checked, double checked Hawking's calculation. He didn't use the replica trick. So it's not that he um, you, didn't include a saddle. He did just a minus trace for the Grau calculation, but he didn't even do that. He did a rep calculation of the state and he got an answer and we haven't, been able to say what it is about his calculation that he did wrong, or what was the, the state that he calculated the, the entropy of? What is that state? What does it look like in our holographic picture? And I think that in order to understand the black hole information paradox properly, we're going to need to understand where things went wrong for Hawking. What is it that he actually calculated in a holographic theory? So uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm welcoming any questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Meta, for your brilliant talk. Questions, please. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, first of all, I have a question about the unitary version of your uh, simple model. So, uh, am I understanding? Yeah, but which one? Let me just go up. Um, okay, the, the, the top one or the, one. the bottom one? The octopus, yes. Uh, uh, the so octopus, okay. Uh -huh. Am I understanding correctly that you have uh, some sort of critical octopus which has a gamma prime equals to sum of gammas, right? Uh, well, so presumably, I mean, the, 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 there's a, um, this is a, these are discrete time steps. So mm -hmm. you, you could imagine that you have one, you have a time step that we are, they're almost equal. And then the next time step, you've already over the, over the bump. Uh, can, can you predict exactly this time step uh, at which the pace transition happens, or uh, is it uh, beyond the, the simple description? Well, I certainly could imagine that you have a time step where indeed the two are equal. And in this case, uh, well, this is the, this is the, the annoying thing that we always have, uh, the problem we always have with the phase transition when you have two, quanta, two extremal surfaces which have exactly the same area, and then you ask, well, what is the entanglement wedge? And you say, okay, that's really, uh, that's really a question that we don't know how to answer, but if you just slightly modify the region and make it a little bit larger, a little bit smaller, then you have a definite answer. So this, uh, the, if, if you're asking about the details of the turnover point and how uh, if the fine grained details of um, this, uh, the fine grained details of 
this transition. Uh, no, we haven't. We haven't worked that out simply because this is a, this is a, a simplified model, and so we would not expect that uh, this defined grade dynamics of this sharp transition here is uh, accurately reflected in the model. It's uh, it gives us the the basic rise here, and it gives us the decrease. But what happens over here? That's uh, that's a, that's a different story. And I have another question. I don't know, maybe it's a semantic question, but uh, in the latter part of your talk, uh, you mentioned that uh, the information conservation uh, can present uh, as a setup point in the theory which actually has information loss. Uh, uh, but uh, you uh, uh, explained it in an example when uh, the uh, surface which corresponds to the information conservation is not homologous. Yeah. to the uh, radiation. But if it's the case, then uh, this uh, surface will not manifest itself as a uh, single point in the uh, entanglement entropy of the Hawking radiation. Is that not right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose I shouldn't have used the word saddle. Uh, a surface that might naively consider including, but really shouldn't. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so I would have the surface as just a setup point in maybe a, some kind of general partition function or whatever. Uh, but uh, if you write down that, I mean, it's a question of whether the non-homologous. Uh, I mean, so so this is this again homologous to the black hole. It's just not not minimal. Um, so gamma is homologous. Do we include non-minimal extremal surfaces? Uh, in a saddle point, and that, I think the answer is probably yes, but do we include non-homologous ones? That's a different question. Uh, and it's not obvious to me that those have any significance. Okay. I don't know that we'd include those in a partition function. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. More questions, please? Sorry, um, mm -hmm. Neta, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, regarding your statement regarding Hawking's calculation. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think I, I'm a little bit confused about your statement uh, regarding. So, so Hawking was calculating the correct state, but somehow he was just calculating a different quantity. Say he was calculating cross grain entropy. So you um, you think this answer is not good enough? No, I don't think so. I don't think he was calculating a coarse grain entropy. I think he was calculating a fine grain entropy of the wrong state. Um, I think the state he was considering just did not include. Uh, the fine-grained corrections that we would have would, we would have expected. I think he was missing something in the state because, as far as I can tell from the calculation, from his calculation, um, he's essentially calculating minus trace rho log rho, which I would say is a uh, is a fine-grained entropy. So, in what sense? Uh, uh, you mean uh, 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 when he calculated the entropy of the radiation? Sorry, can you repeat that? You were just cut off in the beginning. Sorry. Uh, 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 when you say he was doing the uh, uh, when he was doing the wrong calculation, uh, uh, calculation in the wrong states, mm -hmm. you say um, you were referring to his calculation of the radiation. That's that right. He treated That's, right. That thermal. Yeah. That's what you meant. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Of course, that we know. But uh, but but even uh, even when he uh, uh, the fact that he, uh, 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 you were treating the uh, uh, radiation as thermal. That's already a cross grain description, right? Um, I, I suppose you could think of it that way. Uh, I think it's a, I think he was calculating, let me put it this way, I think he was calculating a coarse grained entropy, which is but coarse grained with respect to the actual state. And that this coarse grained entropy is a fine grained entropy of a different state. So this is an um, analogous to uh, this proposal that I had um, with, uh, with, with Aaron Wall, where we had, um, a, uh, a coarse grain, so we had the maximization of the von Neumann entropy, it's like a Jamesian type procedure, you have a maximization of the von Neumann entropy over some set of states. So the end result is a coarse grain entropy, of, but it's the fine grain entropy of some state in an ensemble of states that you're considering. So that would be my guess as to what Hawking was actually calculating. I should say this is current work in progress with Daniel and Chris. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just don't understand. Uh, I'm not sure there's a fundamental difference between that because the say he didn't understand that there's a quantum. Uh, uh, he didn't understand there's a quantum correlation among the radiation, and then mm -hmm. he just cross grain it by thermal state, and uh, and then that from yeah uh, you can say he was calculating the wrong state because he was cross grain it. By, uh, by a thermal state. And then in the sense, then we know what uh, uh, one mistake he made. I, I don't think that coarse graining is quite that simple. Um, I, don't, I think we, we, we can all agree he was coarse graining over something, but it's not, I don't think it's obvious what, um, 
what exactly was the course grading procedure that he was using that would exactly, uh, that, that we, if, if we were to apply it to what we think is the actual state and the actual dynamics, would, would produce exactly the Hawking answer. Yeah, but yeah, we know what he was course graining, right? He just uh, approximated by thermal state. Over what, sorry? He, he just approximated the radiation by a thermal state. Um, I don't- And that approximation is wrong. I don't think I necessarily agree with that statement. Um, but Hawking was not calculating any other state. He was just calculating the thermal state. Yes, but, well, he was calculating, I mean, he, he just looked at the, um, I mean, essentially, he just did a Bogolian of transformation, right? He just looked at the state, the, let me, let me put it this way. I don't, I don't know a way of doing Hawking's, of, of looking at Hawking's calculation and saying, okay, so here is, um, here's the thing that we need to do to exactly execute his calculation, but get a unitary answer. Um, no, I think that this quantum extreme calculation was already doing that, right? Uh, yes, but so Hawking didn't use holography. So, so my point is Hawking didn't use holography and he yeah, didn't use Yeah, it's similar. Uh, we know how to get the unitary answer, but we don't know how to go yeah, through but, this calculation. And then but you didn't exactly that we did use holography. Uh, sorry? Yeah, sorry, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, <laughs> we can discuss more, yeah. Uh -huh.